Welcome back, everybody. This is Kenny Jang with Church Butler. We are continuing with our Lunch and Learn series. Today, you are in for a treat. I am telling you, if you thought our previous ones were spectacular, this is an 11 on a 1 to 10 scale. I can promise you that because we got Brandon Acox in the house today. Welcome, Brandon. How are you doing? Thanks so much for having me. I'm doing great. <laughs> doing great. Um, so, Brandon, you have been all over the interwebs and part of ministry and influenced so many people. Um, your brand awareness is up there, obviously. And I think um, I just want to thank you so much for everything that you've done for the kingdom to date. It just really has been an influence. Um, I know a lot of people watching and listening to this today, um, whether it's personal interaction or from afar, um, your, your impact has gone um, really far. So thank you so much for all that you've done. There are some people somehow that don't know who you are yet. Um, can you just spend, give us a 30 seconds on who you are, what you're doing right now? Uh, the, yeah, 30 seconds. Five <laughs> years ago, I was at Saddleback Church and started running pastors.com. Um, I was there for a year. At the end of that year, they sent us back to Arkansas to plant Grace Hills Church. And I'm still running pastors.com remotely. So those are my two big things, planting Grace Hills and, uh, and running pastors.com. And then I just do some blogging and coaching and that kind of thing. Yeah. And I, and anybody here, if you're following along with um, his church's social and media feeds, uh, I love the humanization and the, the way you use social is really good relationship building with the pastor. Uh, very good modeling. And so um, today I wanted to talk a little bit about Easter because every, it's on everyone's minds, communicators especially, of planning as we count down to Easter this year. Um, is there something that you could talk about? It's because, And I love it that you're a practitioner, not just a consultant, right? So in your ministry, what, what's something new that you guys are trying to get more people in the door for Easter? What's something that you are actually, you know, obviously you're innovating every single year. You're trying to figure out different things and how to get your people to invite more people. Yeah. Uh, what's one or two things that you're doing this year that you're excited about? Well, uh, one of the things that we're, we've done, and of course our church is only five years old and we've done it different every year, but we, we really have this big emphasis on community partnership, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're actually moving away from the big outreach event. No helicopters, um, you know, no huge egg drop soup things going on. In, instead, what we do is partner with a local elementary school, not a Christian school, but just a public school. And we go in on a Friday and do a big egg hunt with them, mm. like every one of their classes. So uh, the way that works is it, it winds up putting us in touch with 500 students uh, almost half of whom are from Hispanic families, which we're, it thrills us to be able to have that connection, you know, and uh, and that the school allows us to put a flyer in every kid's box wow. about what's going on in our church. Uh, and we try very carefully not to abuse that privilege or relationship. We try to walk that line very carefully. Uh, but that's our big thing leading up to that weekend. So we don't do like a big at the mall, at the park, you know, kind of thing. Uh, we do that with the school instead. Then on Sunday, our big thing is that we kick off a sermon series. Now, a lot of churches will conclude a series on Easter. Yes. Um, we do the opposite. We're, we're starting a series this weekend that concludes on Palm Sunday. And then on Easter, we kick off a, a five-part series called Never Be the Same Again. And so it starts with the resurrection. And, and the whole deal is you got all these visitors, and we're saying, you were here for part one. Come join us for part two. So uh, those, those are our two biggest things. I love it. So let's talk about the sermon messaging first, because I think that is so strategic. And so many pastors think that Easter is the end of the rainbow, right? After that, you can go to rest, hibernate, and then come back. And actually, it's not, right? You did your work. You invested in the people that actually came to your church for the first time. And so you're saying... You start a series that Easter Sunday, and so if they liked it, if they really resonated with the message, then you're saying, hey, come back because there's more of it. That's what you're yeah. trying to get them to do. Yeah, we've been trained to think that the end goal is getting people to show up at church. Well, that's the beginning. Uh, that's where it starts. And so it's kind of like the top of the funnel, if you will. Uh, our goal is to help those people become, become disciples. So we see it as uh, looking at Easter as an introduction point, not a grand finale. 
Um, so yes, we'll work hard to get people there. We'll set up a sub site. We'll do a bunch of Facebook ads. We'll do all that kind of stuff. But our, our real goal is saying, hey, you came this one time. Thank you so much. If you never come back again, we're glad you're here. But we really hope you'll come back next week for part two. Uh, and then we, we, we establish things like baptism and our 101 class. They're all arranged so that, you know, two weeks after Easter, we're doing the class. Four weeks after Easter, we're baptizing again, so forth. So everything's kind of, that's the, that's the beginning. Gotcha. So you, you're... That season where Easter's the kickoff is a season for new visitors and new believers, right? So you have all these ministry points that people can plug into, and it makes sense if they actually came for the first time in Easter, developed the relationship with the church, and then walks fo- forward. Okay, that's awesome. Now, did you do that preaching strategy last year or in the past, or is this the first year that you've started a series on Easter? We've done it before. Uh, we haven't done it every year, but but it's it's something I learned from Rick Warren. Rick, Rick talked about it in an article a long, long time ago, and uh, and so I saw it in action at Saddleback, and, uh, and it's this whole idea of what Rick calls pyramiding growth mm. in special days. So you're here, and you go to Easter here, and then you, you're gonna you're gonna drop back down, but you don't want to drop back down as low as you were, um, and all those people that have now been added are you're ready to make disciples. You're yeah. ready to walk them through the process of becoming a you know, devoted follower. Gotcha. So. so what leading up to Easter, the, the how how far in advance are you starting to tease that your congregation, your people, need to be inviting their friends and families? Is it one week away, four weeks, two months? Have you already started telling them about Easter? No, this is going to sound really dumb, but uh, we, we usually wait until the week of um, and, and we don't do our big push with advertising and whatnot until about four days out. Mm. Uh, and I know that again, that runs counter, uh, to what, to what a lot of wisdom yeah. says. So I don't want to encourage people to stop preparing early. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that would be dangerous. But for us, what we've noticed is, uh, 80 to 90% of the traction is Thursday and Friday and yeah. Saturday. Yeah. So that's where. And, and our, we're, we've over time trained our people that when we're about to start a new series, that's the time that we're going to put out a video and we want you to share it. That's the time that we want you to invite your friends and, and so forth. So we, we have this whole system of you've, you've got a closed Facebook group of insiders. You have an open group that's everybody that attends. And then you've got the page. And so we'll mention in the insider group, hey, we're about to put something in the, mm. the open group. And then in the open group, we say, hey, we're about to put something out publicly. And, and so we just sort of get people ready. But, but if we do it too early, it, it just, it's a lot of wasted energy for wow. us. Okay, so that's very interesting. I love that. So your insider group, it's a closed Facebook group. Um, what percentage of your people, how, so how large is your church right now in terms of general attendance? Yeah, about, about 420 per okay. Sunday. And so it's probably larger than that in terms of your community, right? Because not everyone comes every Sunday. Um, and then based on that number, what percentage of them are insiders? How many people are, do you consider worthy of you know, being able to share that, those impulses, the mission, the vision, and stuff like that? Well, interestingly, I would say there are multiple insider groups. So we have what's called a leadership team group. Mm-hmm. That's all the staff and the team leaders. Gotcha. And then we also have like a first impressions group who we look to as, you know, we want to treat them like insiders so they know what's going on. They feel included. We have a, we have just a prayer group. That's some really devoted folks. Yeah, prayer so, warriors. Yeah. Yeah. And we've set up multiple insider groups that I would say total probably 50 people uh, or so 50 adults. Uh, and then that open group of attenders probably has about 350 to 400 yeah. people in it. Gotcha. And so you intentionally will time, synchronize the timing of when you're starting to tell people your plans for Easter. Yeah, yeah. We, like I've already been talking with our leadership team about the sermon series, and we're planning for the the school partnership egg hunt thing. So all that is in the works. We're recruiting volunteers. uh, And then about a week and a half out from Easter, I'll sort of announce, here's what we're, we're teaching on. Um, and then uh, usually like the day after Easter, 
we're thinking about small groups. Yeah. How do how do we get people into groups now? And and so yeah, there's a there's a good sequence, but it all happens pretty quick. Yeah, I love it. Um, and you know, even I don't know if you saw the article. Mark Zuckerberg's been touring the country, or actually the world, getting a sense of what Facebook is going to be in the next iteration. And um, he actually mentioned Saddleback and the church structure. So not it's not just Saddleback. There's church with a capital C, I think, of how the church has a superstructure of a community, and then these subgroups, affinity groups, that all contribute back up, right? It's not just disparate community, uh, small groups. Um, and I love the fact that, that you're, you're doing a similar thing here with Facebook um, in terms of communicating and making sure that everyone's on board swimming together in the same direction. Okay, let's talk about your actual outreach project. Um, how did that come about? Literally, how did you convince the principal or the school district or is did they come to you? Did you go to them? Tell us a little bit about that. It's been a five-year partnership. When we were just planting, we hadn't even launched yet. Uh, we approached them, found out that they were the, they were the poorest school in Rogers. Mm. Like 80% of the students are on some kind of lunch program or whatnot. Uh, it's one of the most diverse schools in Rogers. And we really wanted a, a what we would call a give and give relationship. We didn't want anything from the school. Right. Uh, we don't want to be able to promote Grace Hills at the school. Uh, we're, and, and traditionally, churches will go, hey, we can get something out of this. And people come on Sunday. Uh, we, we purposely avoid that kind of thing. Um, and, and so during the year, every month we're doing something, whether that's uh, dropping off big loads of like um, um, the disinfecting wipes, things they run out of. Uh, Sharpies, things that the teachers are short on, uh, K-cups for the Keurig in the break room uh, that the teachers have to buy. So that kind of stuff's happening. We're doing appreciation dinners and lunches. So you're uh, talking with the school to find out what they need? Year-round, always, yeah. And how far is that school from the footprint of your uh, church or church community? It's about four blocks from oh, where so our, it's, it's right it's, there. Yeah. It wasn't always. We used to be in a theater, and we still partner with that school. But it was neat when we moved over close. And what's really cool is uh, our church is Grace Hills Church. The school is Grace Hill Elementary. <laughs> and we did not know they existed when we named our church. Uh, but there was a retired teacher named Grace Hill. And, and so, you know, perfect partnership. Um, but, but anyways, it's, it's just been a long-term partnership. So our only ask all year uh, of them is um, – and it's not really even much of an ask. It's just, hey, we want to do this egg hunt thing, and can we can we mention Grace Hills this one time during the year? So, and no pushback from the beginning. No, no pushback. I guess no you've pushback. demonstrated that yeah. you are in a relationship where you're not seeking anything out of it. So that trust is there. Yeah, we also created a Facebook group where the teachers at the school and our staff are in a group together, and they make wow. requests of us. So before we do an event, we sort of will communicate about it there so that they know up front we're not sure. looking for anything. Uh, and, and so we've gotten a lot of feedback like, you know, for months we kept waiting for you to ask for something back. And, you know, we never have. So it's just, just been good. And they, the teachers are actually bold enough to ask for things in that group of your church? Yeah. Yeah. When it's... Uh, well, for one thing, we start off every year, uh, we have like uh, during their workshops that they're doing right before the school year starts, we go serve them a big barbecue lunch, uh, all the teachers. We hand out this form that, that asks for their wish list. So what does your classroom usually lack during the year and how can we get involved? So the music teacher wanted recorders, you know, little flute type of recorders. So, you know, we, we, bought, we bought them recorders. Wow. Just, just requests like that come up throughout the year. That's great. That's great. So, um, and is this your largest outreach ministry for your church, or do you have other things going on? We have other things. It's probably the biggest in terms of, um, you know, every month something. But the other thing that we do that's, that's big is, uh, and a lot of churches are doing this now, and I'm excited about it. it wasn't our idea originally, but we're do, we do Love Week, which is one week out of the year where we line up relationships with nonprofits. Uh, not Christian nonprofits necessarily, but just any nonprofit. We plug our people into them for a solid week. So here's 12 projects. Pick one, get involved. 
And our goal is twofold. One is to get individuals comfortable with the idea of volunteering. Yes, somewhere. yes. A lot of people would, would like to do that, but they're too shy to start. Um, but the other is to stimulate small groups doing outreach during the year on their own. Right. So right. Now, now we have all these small groups that do stuff and we hear about it later. You know, they're, they're partnering with the organizations we helped on Love Week last year. So that, that's the other big thing. I love it. Love it. Yeah. One of the things I think that we've missed in churches that are in decline, one of the first prescriptions is every church needs a cause. You need something that's outside the four walls of your building. Stop, stop that holy huddle, right? And get outside and really love on the people that you are crossing path, <laughs> passing by to get to that church building. Definitely. Um, so what about the yield? What has been um, the outcome of doing that type of Easter egg hunt with the school? Do you have actually some families from that school coming to your church at this point? We do. And what's really fascinating to us is the it's a it's very much a long tail payoff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a family start visiting recently that said, hey, we're here because two years ago we got your flyer at the egg hunt. And we're going, wow, you know, so yeah, it's, it's a long tail thing. We've also had, um, we've had some teachers plug in. Uh, we had one of the teachers, um, was in a situation where her husband needed help with an addiction. And so now they're part of our church. We're counseling. Wow. I mean, there's this kind of stuff that's happened as a result. And, and it's kind of like, we just sort of became the go-to if a teacher doesn't have a church and they enter a crisis who are they going to reach out to? I love that. The principal even will connect them to us and say, why don't you reach out to Grace Hills? And so, yeah. It's the been a church great. being the church, right? That's just amazing. Yeah. And it's not a big number. I would not promise, hey, if you partner with right. the school, you're going to double your attendance. You know, we, we don't see that. And that's not what we're looking for. Uh, we're really looking for relationships. And yeah. And that's what we're saying. And I, I, and I personally, my passion is putting, getting people to put their faith into action, right? right? Connecting the dots with what they hear in this in the pews from you on Sundays, and then getting out and actually serving and interacting with other people in the community, um, it really is transformative, right? Um, okay, so what other things are you doing to get more people in the building? Are you guys are doing Facebook ads? Um, yeah, we've actually never done anything in print at all. Uh, never sent a postcard. Um, in fact, while I recommend it, and we should be, we've never done like invite cards. Mm. Uh, it's all been online. Word of mouth. Yeah. So all of our ad spend is on Facebook and Instagram. Gotcha. Um, and, and we've spent, uh, in the five years we've been in existence, we've invested almost $40,000 so far. Oh, on wow. Facebook ads. Wow. Um, worth every penny. Because I can point to stories of people who saw us on Saturday night on Facebook, hadn't been to church in years, if at all, came on Sunday because we're doing a message about, you know, the healing of the soul or whatever, and gave their lives to Jesus that day. And so that's happened numerous times. Um, you know, one Sunday we kicked off a new series, had 70 new visitors, and every single one of them checked Facebook on the, the card, every single one of them. Uh, so that was huge. Um, so, yeah, that's our, that's our biggest thing. So do you have a Facebook manager? Are you outsourcing that? Do you have a specialist or are you doing it? Who's doing your Facebook ads? It, it's me. It's me. But, you know, thankfully, that's a little bit of my own background yeah. anyways. Um, so, and I've, I've gotten educated on it. I try to stay up and read various blogs and websites that kind of give you, here's what Facebook is changing, and right. that kind of thing. So, yeah. And uh, so let's talk about those campaigns. So you are, I'm assuming you're geo-targeting some radius around your church? Yeah. How, how well, far? We, yeah, we usually say, um, so Bentonville and Rogers run into each other. And we usually say, give us everyone in Bentonville and Rogers and 10 miles around both. So that, that kind of covers our area. We're in the corner of the right. state. It's a lot of small towns. And then there. any other restrictions? Just women only, men only, age? What? It, depends on, it depends on what it is. Um, sometimes we've done like a youth event, so we're targeting parents. Uh, we're not targeting youth because they're not going to look at the ad and target the parents. Um, if it's a kid's event, we'll say 45 and down because that right, probably right, wants right. with toddlers. Um, but for the most part, uh, we leave that part of it more general. Gotcha. And so you are actually doing specific – it's not just one ad 
that's generic for Grace Hills that says, hey, if you want to get to know Jesus, come to our church, and that you run it all year long. You actually think about events and then put up ads for those events. Yeah, particularly sermons and sermon series. So almost every week we'll do a preview of what's coming Sunday. Um, and especially leading into a new message series, we'll really promote that heavily. Uh, special events we'll do ads for. We have one ad that gets likes locally. Yeah. And then all the rest of our ads target people who like us and their friends. Right, right, right. So we don't ever target the general public. Uh, we only target people who already have some connection with us. Gotcha. So we uh, now we're up to like eight, 8,100 likes locally, which as far as I can find is, is more than any church in the area, but it's because we've been so focused on it. And consistent, right? Yeah. So it's, it's geography and it's people who like your page and their friends, their social networks basically that you're yeah. targeting. Um, that's great. And then are you doing, it's, I'm assuming they're inline ads. It's not the sidebar ads, right? It's not the tiny little thumbnail ads. We kind of do both, but we like the inline best. And are you doing any video advertising at this point? Very much. Yes. Uh, we don't do a lot of live yet. Um, but we do a, almost every week is some kind of video that's uploaded straight to Facebook and then we sponsor it. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and then Instagram, are you getting any traction from Instagram? What type of content are you doing in terms of ads there? You know, it's been more successful with teenagers. Um, they tend to see things that our Grace Hill students Instagram account is, is posting. Uh, we have a Grace Hill students Facebook page. So the two are integrated on the ad platform. So we get more of a response out of students than we do out of adults. Um, but we get some engagement. Uh, I, I can't, it's hard to quantify yeah. who comes to church because of Instagram, but there's engagement on Instagram. So, gotcha. Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing some of your Easter promotion plans and your outreach. I, I just love, I have a heart for churches that really latch onto a cause and, and the fact that you're doing it in a way that is grace based, right? It's just like no strings attached. We just want to show some love. I, I just, I just love that you're doing that uh, in in real life. So um, tell us a little, a little bit more about you. Um, you actually do coaching, sharing your experience and wisdom and everything that you've learned over the years, both in the big system and even as a practitioner and a church planner. Um, how does that coaching and leadership uh, coaching work with you? Well, for one thing, I've been coached for the last five years uh, or six years, actually. When we started Grace Hills, I felt like we're probably going to die if someone isn't guiding me through this. And so uh, month after month after month, every single strategic decision we've ever faced, I've walked through with a coach. Mm -hmm. We weigh it out, come up with an action plan and, and work through it. So it's helped me make decisions. It's helped me take next steps. It's helped me get unstuck. Uh, so probably a year or so ago, I had been through some coaching training in the past, but never acted on it, never used it professionally. But about a year ago, um, talk to Sean Lovejoy. He runs courage to lead.com. So I do, I now do coaching with courage to lead. So about a dozen guys right now that I just, once a month we meet by video, walk through whatever it is that's keeping them up at night. And then during the month, we just sort of stay in touch, text back and forth. How did that meeting go? How's it going for you this week? And then sometimes it's like the other night I got a 7 PM call from a guy's like, man, I'm really struggling. I had a tough conversation today. I just need to talk through this. And, and so all that kind of, to me, is part of the coaching slash mentoring relationship. Gotcha. So it sounds like you do, in this, it's, it's one to many. You have a, a mid-sized group that actually are um, in a session together with you. So they get to know each other as well? I should actually clarify, everything I do is one-on-one. One-on-one. But Sean also does... So there are about six or seven guys coaching for Sean. Yep. Everyone that we coach gets once a month coaching from Sean as a group. Gotcha. Yes. So, yes. Oh. Yeah. I love the I love one on one coaching because you can actually move the needle in very specific ways with ministries if you're able to be concrete about it, very definitive. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think one of the things that most pastors suffer from is loneliness. Right. You feel isolated. You don't have the peer to talk to. Um, yeah. And coaching is really the sounding board that you need many times.
Yeah. Um, how, how do the people specifically fit, find out more information about those coaching opportunities with you in particular? Yeah. The easiest way is just hit brandonacox.com. Um, and, and there is links to the coaching, links to everything else I do. So, yeah, that's the, that's the quickest way. Gotcha. And then um, is that the, also the best way if people want to get in touch with you directly just outside of coaching um, to learn more about Grace Hills or Pastors.com? Um, what's the best way to do that? Is it Carrier Pigeon, Twitter, Snail Mail? How do, how do people get in touch with you directly? Yeah, if, if you're on BrandonAcox.com and you go to the About page, it has um, social links. It has, here's the things I do. Uh, it also has a contact form at the bottom that comes straight to me. So Perfect. I love conversational email, you know. Um, so I'm pretty easy to easy to reach. Yeah, um, I just encourage people to watch what Brandon is doing. The stuff that you're doing with your church on social is really um, it's it's inspiring and it's encouraging to see how you're using that. And, uh, and you are such an accessible guy. Um, I, I love the fact that you are just generous with your time and your wisdom, and that your your heart really is there for the kingdom in an authentic way. So. Thank you so much for everything that you are doing. Really appreciate your time here with us today in our Lunch and Learn. Um, and we'll have to get you back here at another time uh, to share with some other aspects of your ministry because I think you're doing so many innovative stuff. So appreciate your time today, Brandon. You're very welcome and thanks so much for having me. Okay, take care. Mm -hmm.